Thanks, Gerald. I, uh, I'll try putting on my video for a little bit here and then I'll turn it off and, and share my screen. Um, really appreciate that um, introduction. And uh, I, 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 I messaged on Discord a little bit, a pointer to my, uh, my outline of my talk here, which is in a public repo. Um, and so, so you guys can follow along. There's also um, the PCAP file that I'm going to be, be using. But um, let me just go ahead and share my screen here. And um, I'll turn off my video and show you what's going on here on my desktop. Desktop video, share. Um, so I assume you all can see this now. Um, so like I said, there's this repo here. Um, you can bring that up. Uh, and follow along, or you can just watch the Zoom here. Um, I'm going to I'm going to be working th with three windows here. This is the Brim application that Gerald mentioned, um, and then I'll do some stuff in the terminal here. And this is just a, a Git clone of this repo with uh, you know the various little test files I have in there. Um, you can read through the abstract. Um, I mentioned this stuff, um, and so let me jump to kind of a little, the introduction. Well. Gerald already mentioned PCAP and BPF and all that stuff that I did like way long ago when I didn't have gray hair. Uh, I was an undergrad at UC Berkeley working at Lawrence Berkeley Lab and uh, re really fun times. Um, and then more recently, um, you know, Ger Gerald mentioned I had founded Riverbed and we acquired Case Technology, which was, um, which involved Loris Stegiani and, and Gerald joining Riverbed. And so those are really fun times and the future was bright. And uh, they invited me to give a talk at the Stanford Shark Fest in 2011. And that was 10 years ago. And I haven't given a public talk since then. So I kind of crawled in a hole. Um, and, and, and I didn't know really what to talk about then because I wasn't working on PCAP stuff. Um, and so that talk, which you can follow the links to, or maybe you saw it, was all about kind of the history of, of the Berkeley packet filter and TCP dump and, and the group at LVL. Um, but now I've crawled out of my hole and I'm doing something new. And uh, I have some stuff to talk about with that has to do with caps and packets and stuff. Um, and the interesting part of the story here is um, as we worked on this PCAP stuff, there was just this thing that was pulling me toward this, this way of managing data and modeling data differently. Um, that I just thought was, you know, there's something here and, and all these data systems are hard and why are they hard? And maybe there's a way to, 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 to um, represent data better. And so that's what Zed is all about. So Brim's the application, Zed is the data model and the backend system. And um, I was recently uh, catching up on, on different things and I, I came across uh, Doug Crockford's talk on JSON and uh, he made this point at the beginning of his talk, there's a link here to it, that he felt like he, he discovered JSON, he didn't invent it. And that was just like, it struck me because I, I had told my team the same thing like nine months ago, a, a year ago, when I was working on Zed and the different formats and the type system and how it all fit together, I really felt like I was just, it was like I had this sense like, well, it's gotta work this way. So it wasn't like I was inventing it, I was just searching for it. Um, and it all came together. So that, so Crockford's uh, comment that really, really resonated. So of course you go out in the world and you try to like tell people about your great ideas and people, people tell you, you don't know what you're talking about. So like, it was probably about 18 months ago, I started like the venture capitalists and professors of databases and, and all this kind of stuff. And there was like this resounding pushback, Steve, the world does not need another data model. And, and see, really, the world does not need another query language. Just if you're going to do something, just use SQL. And uh, the best one was, Steve, nobody cares about your tech. What problem are you solving? And I just felt like there was a problem that was actually intertwined and rooted in the tech and, and this stuff. And so I was stubborn. I persevered. And I couldn't articulate it at the time, but I felt we were on to something. And now we're just, I think we're just getting to the point now. We've worked on it for like three years where it's come together and we can talk about it. So despite this pushback, you know, we built some useful stuff and we put it out there. It's been great to work with the community and get feedback uh, on what we're doing. And one of the early conversations I had with somebody who really loved 
the, the Z format, we, we, we love to talk to our users. We get on Zoom all the time and get feedback. And uh, I said, why do you like this? Why do you like it so much? You could, you could do this other way. You could use databases, you can use Spark, you can use Parquet, why do you like Z? And he just said, well, once my data is in Z, everything is just easy. So that wasn't like a real technical answer, but it's just like, okay, good, we're on something. And then we all love this early tweet on, on Twitter. Let's be honest, Broom is beautiful. We love being called beautiful, so that was nice. Um, and like I said, underneath all this, it's, it's like we have this gut instinct that Brim and Zed is bigger than just this app and search experience. We really think there's something up in the in the data model, and and it's really all about the ergonomics for data engineering and making it easier. So, <clears throat> one of the guys on my team, uh, I'll introduce him in a sec, uh, had, was kind of listening to this practice version of this talk and said, "You know what? I think you're trying to say." He said, Zed will do for data lakes what JSON did for APIs. And there was a simplicity to that. It's like, yeah, when JSON came along, all of a sudden it was really easy to like set up services that talk to each other and node came along. And, 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 and we're really focused on taking this complicated data engineering stuff and trying to make it really easy. Okay, so, so in that sense, Zed and Brim have kind of become our research vehicle for exploring this. But it's also the thing we're building that I think is, is, is going to be really, really useful. Um, so we're committed to open source. Uh, here's the repos. It's all under the BSD license. And I just wanted to say um, this BSD license, it's the copyright, the UC Regents copyright that the lawyers from UC gave us way back when, 30 years ago. For, yeah, 30 years ago when we put it on TCP dump and, and, and PCAP and all of that. And uh, there was no web. And we put all the software up on um, you know, the FTP server, which is still there, ftp.ee.lbo.gov. And it wasn't even called open source. We just said, here's our software. It's freely available. It's on this FTP server. And so the word open source came later. Um, Anyway, we focused on kind of this PCAP um, use case. Oh, I forgot I wanted to do something here. Let me let me jump over here. This is going to take a little bit, so I wanted to, to get this going. So I'm going to drag this PCAP file in here. Um, it's going to take a few minutes to chug away, which I'll explain in a second. And so while that's running, um, let me continue here. Um, and that PCAP is the there's the link in in Discord uh, that points to it. Um, and so, <clears throat> so while that's loading, uh, let me talk a, a little bit about the model. The idea here is it's a little bit like uh, Mongo where Mongo has collections. You don't have database tables, you have just collections, kind of bags of data. And we call them pools because we like this lake abstraction. So. Um, I've got these pools. I've got a little backup pool here in case something goes wrong here. I don't think it will. Um, and we have this, this sort of helper application called BrimCap. That is the whole, that all the PCAP intelligence lives in BrimCap. BrimCap is a, is a little go, tool built in Go. Um, the Z service, which manages the lake, is also written in Go. And the Brim application, this thing, um, is an Electron JavaScript app like, you know, Slack and things like that. Um, and so when you run BrimCap, it launches a local Z service endpoint um, in the background. Uh, and we built it that way uh, with the intention of, uh, of scaling out. And I'll get to that a little bit later in the talk here. So BrimCap uh, is sitting here chugging away chewing on this PCAP and what it's doing is it forked a Zeke and a Suricata and it handed the PCAPs to the Zeke and the Suricata. It's taking the logs from Zeke, uh, which are in uh, a really nice TSV tab separated value format with schemas embedded in it. And it's taking the Suricata JSON files and it's taking that, that data and it's shaping it into Z, and then it's posting these Z logs to the, to, to the Z service. Um, at the same time, it stores the PCAP. Uh, it builds a little index of the PCAP so you could quickly take a flow ID and a time range and find the packets that uh, comprise a flow. 
um, and, and all that stuff gets built. And there's a nice uh, model where BRIM is sort of like the search tool. It gives you the high level contacts from the logs from Zeke and Suricata of what's in your PCAP. Um, I meant to start this a little sooner. So I think what I'll do is I'll switch to my backup pool while this is running, we'll let that complete. And then it might be a little sluggish because of all the stuff that's running. Um, but let me just give you a little tour of the Brim app here. So first of all, it's a search experience. So it looks familiar, kind of like Kibana, kind of like Splunk, um, but it's different. I can type an IP address and because of the Z data model, Brim understand that Brim in the back end and the search understands that's an IP address and I'm gonna search for IP addresses. So it goes through the logs and it finds, finds that IP. Um, of course, we're all networking people here. So we have networks too. And what does it mean to search for a subnet? It means find all the IPs that are in that subnet, right? Obviously. So that's not a literal search like, you know, a search system would do, you know, looking for a string that looks like that. It actually understands the data type. And of course you can do keyword searches. So I can look for all the weird logs from Zeek. Um, I might look for two, two things, alert and spam. Um, and so that pulled that out. Um, and uh, sort of clicking ahead here. It's so, so the other idea here of Brim is it's sort of like a generic way to explore that data, but it also has security knowledge. So we're experimenting with this idea of could we build an application framework that you can easily with like maybe some simple plugins, create different skins to this application experience. And so our first cut is a, a security skin that understands Zeek and Suricata. And so if I do things like click on this SSL log, the log detail comes up. It's a little slow because of the competition for the CPU. And I can see the underlying connection here. I can see the different files that were transmitted over this connection. I can see the different hosts that you that access the same file. I can click on this alert and see what happened here. Potential corporate uh, privacy violation. That, came, that information came from Suricata. And then here's the magic where I go to the con log and now I wanna see the packets. So I click on the little shark fin that hits brim cap, brim, brim hits brim cap says, here's the information from the con log. I have the, I have the address information and I have the time range, the start time and the duration. So give me all the packets from that thing. It makes a little temp file and it launches Wireshark on that connection. A lot of you have probably played with this, um, but this is this connection between, I have to say, well, that was one of the visions back in the day at Riverbed with a shark appliance and Wireshark and, and uh, the, the technology pilot that um, Case had developed. This idea that you could do these searches and then drill down. Well, Zeek logs and the Brim search experience is a different way of doing this kind of drill down. We didn't have to build a big index of all the fields and all the packets to make this work. Um, okay, so this is almost done. Um, let me introduce my team. This has been a great fun team effort. We're really small. So we've been in this research mode. We're not a classic startup where we're focused on a really narrow problem. It's kind of big and we're creating an open source project as opposed to commercializing it and existing successful open source projects. So it's different, um, but that's the way I like to do things. I don't have to do things the normal way everybody else does. Um, anyway, our team's been, been great. James and Mason are on the front end. Um, there, I finally com completed that. The reason that took so long is it, it gave all this data, this big PCAP file, four gigabytes to Zeke and Suricata to process. That was the bottleneck. Once they were done, I've got all the logs distilled now and, and stored in my pool here. So I'll use demo.pcap now. And so when I do this drag of a file, it automatically creates a pool that's named after the file you dragged in and sets you up to search. So back to the team. Um, 
So that are, those are front end guys, they're coders, but they're also designers. So we don't have any help on the design front. They did all this, it's amazing. Those guys are good. Um, on the infrastructure side, uh, I'm kind of leading that with, with uh, Noah and Matt. And we had uh, Al, Al Landrum on board for a while who really helped with uh, some of the concepts of how we'd map our tech onto cloud storage. And then Henry Dubois Fer Ferrier, I'd like to mention just, he really, Super smart guy, he lives in Switzerland, worked with for many years. He just had this really insightful uh, idea about um, how to use the type system here. And I'll, I'll highlight that a little later. And then we've got Phil. Phil does everything that's not development. If you go on Slack or public Slack and ask a question, he'll be all over it. Phil's great. Um, and then, like I said, it's kind of a research project. So about a year ago, I reached out to my friends at UC Berkeley and we started talking about all this data model stuff. And uh, we've been collaborating with them on kind of the academic side of things. And we, we actually have a paper that we just submitted this week and uh, hopefully something interesting will be published from this group. So it's been fun working with the Berkeley guys. All right, that's kind of the setup and intro. Um, you look at this stuff and you say, wow, it looks a lot like Elk. Why don't you just use JSON for your data format and Elastic? Um, and boy, Elastic and JSON has just had a huge impact on the world. Uh, there's a lot of merit to that idea and that's what everybody else does. Um, you know, Doug Crockford invented JSON and we went from this world where APIs were hard to a world where we had Node and JSON and all of a sudden and REST APIs were really easy. And then building on that, Shea Bannon came along and said, Jason's great for a data model. It's great for an API. Let's make a search engine. So he took Lucene, wrapped a REST API out on, around it, figured out how to shard it. It's really complicated stuff, but he made all that easy. And so you have this model where you could just post JSON docs to an API and submit JSON search queries. Um, and I had this phrase, I actually ended my Stanford talk 10 years ago with this concept that it's, it's hard to make things easy. And every once in a while you come along, you figure it out, you crack the code, and then in hindsight, it's obvious, but it wasn't until these guys came along. So they did this brilliant, brilliant thing. But as we got into this problem, and we really kind of fell in love with the Zeek data model, where it had all this rich information about the data types, you'd put it into Elastic, and it would lose that information, and you'd have all sorts of trouble. Um, and then the other thing we saw as we talked to a lot of people is this design pattern where search just isn't enough. So you'd often have a, we saw this over and over again, where you have all these sources of observability data, Zeek sensors, logs, agents, uh, what have you, you know about all this stuff. And then you'd have some kind of ETL pipeline that would be based on like a bunch of schemas that you wanted to land this data in. And people use Logstash for that or Apache NiFi, different things. And then some of the data you send off to a search cluster, whether it's Splunk or Elk or what have you, or now open search. Um, but then a lot of these large scale deployments would have a data lake right next to the search cluster that redundantly held and usually held more data for a longer term. And that was where they would do batch analytics and historical stuff. <clears throat> and these data lakes were usually built either as a data warehouse like ClickHouse or Maybe it's in the cloud, maybe it's BigQuery or Snowflake, or maybe it's just Parquet files on S3 or on Outpost. And so you had this bifurcation and it just struck me like, this doesn't feel right. <laughs> and it's all organized around schemas. And so focusing on schemas will really let us think about maybe, maybe that's where the problem's coming from. And so schemas are super important. They normalize your data. They clean it all up, but there's a double-edged sword. And so what I realized, while schemas are essential as an organizing policy for your data, they really get in the way as a mechanism for storing and transporting data. Um, and so I, I'll just go through a few examples here. I've got five, I'll just touch on a couple um, of, of how like schemas get in the way. And so here's that same picture. Let's say I have a Zeek sensor feeding my Zeek logs into this ETL system. Somebody comes along and finds a fancy new plugin online and puts the new plugin on Zeek. And that adds a column or a new field to the con log, which is great, Zeek can do that. But I just made a change over here and now all of a sudden downstream, my ETL 
system is running along and it gets this new thing and it goes, gee, I don't have a table to put this into. What do I do with this? Worst case, it just drops it on the floor and doesn't tell you. Better case is it, is it, is it fires an alarm and uh, sends you an alert and logs it. And then you, you go, oh, the schema changed. Let me update my tables. Let me update my ETL logic. It's just difficult and cumbersome. Um, another example is sending Zeek logs into Elastic. Elastic's great, um, but it's based on JSON. And so they realized this was a shortcoming. And so they have this thing called the Elastic Common Schema, which is a great rich type system. And here's what a Zeek log looks like, which has all this rich type information about what's going on. And so you do this crazy song and dance where with configuration on the Zeek side, you have to tell Elastic, hey, I'm gonna send you a foo, but when I send you foo, I'm gonna change it to bar. And so when you get a bar, here's some rules for how you change the bar back into a foo. It's crazy. And so you've set these ingestion map pipelines and all this stuff. Um, if you know about Parquet, you have to know the schema before you can write the data into the Parquet file. Um, if you know anything about Kafka over, over this format, Avro, uh, and how Kafka has a schema registry, there's all these moving parts um, that, that have to do with managing the schemas because you're using the schema to define how you transport the data. Um, and then protobuf, similar. It's great, high performance. But anytime you change a protobuf or your schemas that are your protobufs, you have to recompile everything and redeploy. And so in thinking this through, you realize, well, the schema is your, the organizing policy for your data. It's also the very same schema that constrains the mechanism for encoding that data. Um, and so I think of this as a policy mechanism split. And there's this old um, adage in, in systems design that you should separate policy from mechanism. So figure out what your building blocks are and then figure out how to take those building blocks and implement the policies you want. Um, and so the question is, could this be good advice here with all this data engineering stuff? Um, and so enter Z. So we think we have a better way. And if we cast in terms of this policy and mechanism, what if the mechanism were a data model where you had a comprehensive type system and the types were embedded in the data itself. And then on top of that, you had first class types and we'll get to, to why this is important in a minute where the types can actually be values and can actually be serialized as their own type values. And then if you had the entities in a system like this that could adapt to any data type you throw out, uh, throw at it instead of being configured to understand the kind of rigid set of schemas, maybe this would be a better way. Um, and so if the, if the mechanism were this and the policy was somehow an interpretation of the type system, then and rather than rely on a set of rigid schemas, this is kind of like, maybe this is an easier way to think about all this. Okay. So um, to explain all this, I thought, I would just show you. So rather than have lots of talky talk, I'm going to show you some stuff um, in the command line and bounce between the command line and the Brim app. Um, so we took this kind of composable tools approach to this uh, software project where anytime we have an idea for a new piece of functionality that's part of the infrastructure, we implement it as a command. And that way, you think through what is the, what is the interface the command? What's the command called? How do I interface the command to the system? And it's great for test and debug and it's great to learn the system. And we have tons of tests that use all these different commands in different ways to do unit tests of the different bits in the system and then system tests to put it all together, of course. Um, and so it's been a great way to kind of build the thing. And then each command if you do it right, is then kind of a verb in the REST API service. And so it all hangs together in a, in a really easy, easy to think about way. Okay, so we have all these commands and like the Docker command, if you're familiar with that, there's one kind of master Z command and then there's sub commands that hang off this. And uh, you can just you know type Z and it'll give you help and tell you what the sub commands are. Um, and there's one, 
um, in particular, Z query that I'm going to show you a lot of, and then there's another important one called Z API. And Z API is the way you run the command remotely on an, uh, on a service endpoint that's managing a Z lake. And so you can run a service endpoint with Z like serve. And then we have some shortcuts. So Z query, you can just say ZQ. That's kind of a play on GQ, JQ if you know about the JQ tool. And then Zappy is the shorthand for Z API. So I am going to use this little pattern. I'm going to echo some input and I'm going to run ZQ. I'm going to take standard in and I'm going to tell it to pretty print the output of the Z. And the first thing we wanted to do with Z is say, let's leverage JSON. Everybody knows JSON. It's really simple. It's familiar. And so Z is a superset of JSON. So all JSON documents are also Z values, um, but there's more. Um, the human readable form of Z is called JSON. And so we could take this thing that's JSON, which like I said, is also Z and give it to Z ZQ and and ask it to print it, pretty print it. Um, so here it is, it looks like JSON. It's a little bit different. The fields aren't quoted, because why do you need quotes? Those are hard to type all the time. Um, but if you have funny characters in the field name, we do put quotes around it. And so there's some rules about how that works. But again, it's kind of like, let's make, it's hard to make things easy. Let's not require quotes on the field names if we don't have to. And then just to convince you, we really are a superset of JSON. We handle all the funny corner cases. So empty string can be a field name in JSON. Empty object can be a value. That actually works in Z. Um, and then ZQ is kind of a Rosetta Stone. So we have like lots of support for different output formats. So you can output as JSON, you can output as CSV, you can even output as the Z TSV log format. Um, but unlike JSON, Z is comprehensive. So there's a really nice comprehensive type system. And again, we, we really focused on, let's try to make this really easy. So make it easy for the human, maybe hard to parse. Um, and so that's, that's what we did. And so here's, here's a file in the repo with let me put all this, a bunch of values pre-printed here. And the first thing to notice, this looks just like JSON, but it's different. That's an integer. So that's actually an 64 bit integer. This one is a floating point. That's just like JSON, since all numbers in JSON are IEEE 64 bit floating point. That's what that is. And then here's where things get a little bit interesting. What if I have, say, an unsigned 8 bit integer? There's a type for that in Z. So we have this concept of a type decorator. It's like a cast, and it's, it's just informing uh, this ZSON parser that this is not a regular integer, it's an unsigned 8 bit integer. Of course, we have support for date times using the standard ISO format. These are durations. This uses the Prometheus syntax, which Go also uses. Um, of course, you can buy IP addresses. You can have networks. You can have arrays. So this is an array of 64-bit integers by default. Here's an array of 32-bit integers. And then this is interesting. This is this little doohickey is um, the sigil for a set. So this is actually a set of strings and the Z language has set, set operators built into it. And then this gets really interesting because what we're doing here is we're defining a, a name for a type called HTTP methods. This little equal is the definition of a type name. And this definition is a set of strings. So the type of HTTP methods is set of strings. Um, and so we didn't declare the type, we just decorated a value and as a side effect, created the type name for that type of that value. We also have maps, any key, any value. These can be, th these are strings here, but they could be any Z data type. Um, and then of course you put records inside records, just like JSON. So what we don't do here is define a schema and then fit values into the schema. We don't want to have the schema at this layer. Instead, data is typed and it's always self-describing. Um, it means we don't need things like a schema registry to manage all this stuff. And so just here's a little example. I can use ZQ. I can use the same query language that works in Brim here on the command line. 
And all I did here was cut some values from that file. I added two together and I applied this network operator to get this net, class C net of that IP address. Okay, a little bit about first class types. So <clears throat> like I said, Z values, it's all statically strongly typed. They always have a type and, set and it's first class. So Z types are Z values. Um, and so we have this type of operator to take a Z value and give you the type of that value. So I can do something like this and I can say, here's a record, give me the type of field S. Well, that's string. So this is what a type value looks like. It's a type inside of parentheses inside of ZSOM. Um, well, then you might ask the question, what is the type of type of S? Well, I can do that. Well, it's type. So of course, the type of a type value is type type. Makes sense. All right, then I wanna introduce the special concept of this. It's like in SQL, you refer to columns declaratively. This refers to the current record dec declaratively. So if I do something like this, right? Say, make a copy of this. Well, this on entry, this is this. So the copy field becomes that thing. Um, and so then you can ask, well, what's the, what's the type of this? In this case, the type of this looks like this. This is a record type whose components are a single field called S of type string. And that's how you express that type in the Z syntax. And let's get this part. But then things can get interesting. So if I take a more complex record, this type looks like this. And then I told you before, we could have type defs. And so we can name this type. And so if we name this type, again, as a side effect of a value, and I take type of that, I have a type name called employee, and I have this type signature. That's, that's a record, name, string, name, city, salary, and string, string, float. Um, so that's really interesting because now that starts to look like a schema uh, or the type of a relational table. And so let me motivate this a little bit um, by showing you how we can take relational data and stick it inside a brim. Um, and so I have just a few files here. The problem with CSV, I'm gonna start with CSV. The problem with CSV is it doesn't have type information. Um, and so there's a whole thing around what do you do with CSV? How do you get into the database? All that kind of stuff. What we've done in Z is to try to make it easy. So I said schemas are bad, but if you have CSV, you kind of want to define the schema. So I'm going to, with this Z, I can use the cast operator on the type I define to take the CSV input and stick it into a, a file. I'm calling this file pile.csum because it's going to be a pile of stuff that has a couple tables in it and and uh, some junk. So let me take the employee CSV, the deal. So these are sale employees who are salespeople and they're working on deals. Um, and then I'm gonna add the junk to it. So here is my pile of junk. I've got the deal records, I've got the employee records, and then I have some junk. Okay, so let's th get this into Brim. I could just drag pile.zson into Brim, but what I'm going to do is use the zappy command just to show you how, um, since Brim is running uh, Z like serve on localhost, I can just run zappy, which uses a default port to connect to localhost, and I can create uh, a pool called pile of stuff. So it created a pool. There's these unique IDs of things in the system. And then I'm going to do this thing that's a little bit like get, where I'm going to say use, which is kind of like get checkout. But with this data lake, you don't want to check out the whole lake to your local laptop. So you just say, I want to use the main branch of pile of stuff pool. And then I can say, let's load that up with this file I just made from the CSV stuff and the junk. So Brim, let's go over here. Here it is, it showed up. Here's my stuff. And it doesn't look like Zeker Suricata, so Brim doesn't really know how to make it look pretty. It doesn't have timestamps. Um, and there's no single schema to organize it as a table. But um, what we did was we said, if, if these Z types are like schemas, 
then I can use a type name to look like a table in the relational world. And I can use relational style queries, which by the way, I said earlier, nobody wants a new query language, I have to use SQL. So I was like, okay, I'll compromise there. I will make Z a superset of SQL. And so you can take the SQL select command, run it in this pool, and you get all the records from the employee table, AKA employee record type. Um, and you can see, you can mix and match. SQL's just, just a expression in Z. So I can pipe the output to Z operator and I can see, yes, these all have the same type signature, which looks like a schema. Um, and then I save these queries that are here in, little, in my little query thing here. So I can do, you know, select all this normal select stuff. I'm not here to t teach you SQL, <laughs> but you know, it does, it does like, you know, here's, a, here's an aggregation and a group by, so group by name order and then order by the forecast and descending order. And of course, SQL can do joins. So here's a join where we took the customer or the customers from the deal uh, table and the phone numbers from the employee table and we join them on, on the name field. Um, so the point here is if I go back to my, to here, I was able to do these queries. It didn't matter that there was junk in the way. The, the system's perfectly happy to run a SQL query over all the records that look like a table. Um, and that's different. What that's saying is I don't need to define a schema in a table and then put the data into a table constrained by the schema before I can do stuff with it. Um, and so I, I gave a version of this talk earlier to my team and I wasn't explaining the schema policy thing very well. So I pointed, James was like, I don't understand it. So I pointed him at a, at a uh, the Wiki, Wikipedia article on it and he wrote this nice summary. And he said, so to summarize my understanding, a database has a mechanism to write data to disk. It also has a policy that that data in a table must conform to a schema. Therefore, to use the right data to disk mechanism, that data must conform to the policy of the table's schema. With Z, data need not conform to any policy before it gets saved. Then later a policy can deem certain types of data valid based on its shape. And we like to use this word shape to also refer to the schema or the type of the data. And that gets us into this idea of schema discovery. So I've, I've kind of described to you how we can kind of use traditional SQL database stuff with, with this ad. Um, but let's, let's go back to kind of the, 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 we've got a bunch of stuff in our, our pool and we want to understand what it is. And so there's this idea of schema discovery or data introspection. And I had mentioned Henry, he had the insight about a year ago where he said, hey, if we had type values, first class types in this system, then anywhere a value can appear in a Z expression, a type could appear. And particularly, in particular, it could be a group by key. And so this nice little idea to do a count by type of this is really powerful because now I can see how many different shapes are in my pool and see the type of each one of them. And I like this query so much. I have a, I have a little query here that I've saved called shapes. So if I go back to the, to the logs and I click on shapes, there it is. Here are all my schemas and here's the count of each one. Now this is really cool because now this gives me a way to start to explore things. And if I don't like the shapes of things, I can figure out how to change them and then create rules to quote, we call it shape the data the way you want it. Um, but what you can see here, oh, I was doing this in this one. If I do shapes over here, I have the same thing going on here. And so what you could see very quickly is, okay, I've got the clean stuff here and I don't know what this is. This, this isn't what we want, um, but I could do, now that I've seen the thing, I can do a query. Nope, sorry. I can do a query here to give me the, oh, here it is. I don't want this stuff in here. Um, and so clearly if we wanted to get the clean data, the query would look something like this. Um, 
And then you're like, okay, I've got that junk in there. Maybe I want to, I want to clean this up and put it in a new pool. Well, that's easy to do. Let's create a pool called clean tables. Let's run this query. Sorry. Let's run this query, which does a from the pile of stuff filter by the, this expression and then pipe that output to another load command where we use the clean tables. And now having run that, here they are. And now if I look for the junk, or actually let's just do by type of this. I can see I've got clean data. I've got just the stuff I want in there. Pretty powerful. Um, now I kind of went out of order. Let me go back to this one and, and the shapes. Okay, and, and continue where I left off. This is great, but it would be even more clear if instead of seeing all these like kind of hard to read types, which is great, you actually could see a sample of each value. Well, guess what? That's where we could use this expression and we use an any aggregator instead of a count. So instead of computing a count of values, the any aggregator just gives you one item of the group by at random. And, um, and then if I cut out, if I cut just that field, I will just get a value. And so here is a set of samples of data of each shape. And so the quick thing you can see here is Zeke logs have this wonderful property that this path field really it's unique per shape. And so you can start to see very quickly um, patterns in your data and, 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 and do introspection. We like that thing. We like that um, building block so much. We actually have a shortcut, we call it sample. And you can actually sample different fields. You know, you can give it an expression. It's very handy. Um, now here's, here's something interesting. So, so we have, we have this, if we, go, if we go back here and we say, you know what? I don't like all these different heterogeneous schemas. I would like to put everything in one schema and take a union of all the different schemas. And we have an operator for that, it's called fuse. So if I take the output of this and I give it to fuse, fuse will fuse all those values into a single schema. So now this appears as columns. And you could see <clears throat> if you wanted to put this into a relational table, it would have to look something like this. It is super wide. Um, so this isn't very practical to look at. So you, you probably don't want to do that. But if you, you know, if you have tables, it's nice to look at them this way. But when you have this semi-structured data, it's, 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 it doesn't really fit. Now, the point here with the sample pipe views is this table is exactly how data warehouses work and how Parquet works and how a lot of people use Parquet. What, what they do is they figure out all their data models. They create this big wide schema. We call them Uber schemas. And then you populate values in this, this big wide Uber schema very sparsely. And there's lots of nulls in these columns. And 20 years of data warehouse development and research has created warehouses that work on these structures and they work really, really well. And they, these columns of nulls compress down and you can do columnar analytics and they're all super fast. Um, and so you gotta ask the question, if that's the way data warehouses work, how could you possibly use a data model like Zson with something like this? It's gonna be really slow. You need the Uber schema and you need to do this the way all the data warehouses do this. And the truth is Zson really is slow and inefficient. And I designed it for readability and I designed the parser for correctness, not for speed. And it would not be easy to write, um, write a fast parser of Zson. You have to, you actually have to do a type analysis and a data a semantic analysis that takes the type decorators and flows them down into the records. It's not that easy. Um, but that wasn't the point of Zson. The point is the Z data model. And actually we can make Z go really fast by stealing the good ideas from these uh, data formats, Avro and Parquet. So Avro is like a, a record-based, a row-based format that came out of the Hadoop ecosystem. It's binary. And to create an Avro file, you need to say, here's the schema and here are the values. 
And Parquet is the columnar format that came from originally from Google's work on Dremel and that got published and then uh, the Parquet open source form came from this, this work. Um, the problem is it's got all the schema rigidity to both these, these formats. And we looked at them closely and we really just wanted to use them in Z, but it was like, no, they don't work. It's got the schema thing. And so we've created two other formats called Zing and Zest um, that are like F1 Parquet and they're pretty performant. And, but the difference is you don't have to define the schema. All of the data is self-describing and um, it all fits into the, into the row basing format or call row base zest format. And the way this works is there's this data structure that actually took a, a bit of time to get right um, that we call the type context. This is all kind of buried in the code. So this is a little bit of, of sausage how it works. And the type context is like, there, there's these little type defs in the Zing stream. So every time you encounter a type you haven't seen, you, t you get a type def and you put it in the type table. They're very fine grained. They're not schemas at the top level. They build up to a top level record or a schema um, and it's locally scoped. So it's not like a global schema registry. It's locally scoped to the Zing stream itself. They are mergeable very efficiently. You can take two different streams with two different type contexts and easily create a third type context, um, which we do all the time in the system. And you can concatenate them and so they work great with Unix pipes. So if I show you this little record A in example one, this says make, make it zing. And I take this thing and, and put it in example two, I can show you here's, it's really binary. These FF are end of stream. And so the type context gets reset. And then if I just concatenate them together, it does the right thing. So I've concatenated and piped to ZQ um, on standard grid. And then Zest is columnar. And unlike that big Uber schema and the, the kind of the parquet approach where you say, okay, here's my schema and then here are my values that fit that schema, Zest is self-organizing. So it just looks at the, the records that are coming in and it organizes the columns around the type system. So we were able to create a columnar format based on the type system rather than the rigid model of schemas. And so really quick here, I'll take my, my pile of, 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 of data I created earlier. That's not all in one schema. I will convert this to zest. And then here's the hex dump of it. So you can see up over here, all the names are together. All the customers are together, names together, phone numbers together, it's columnar. Um, now here's what's really, really cool. I could take this zest and I could turn it into zing. And then I can take this Zing and I can turn it back into Zson. So I've boomeranged from Zson to Zest to Zing and back to, to Zson. And it's character for character the same. That's really powerful because it means you have a row format, a column format, a human readable format that's richly typed, that doesn't need schema definitions and it's completely compatible. No loss of information when you go, go through things. Of course, we have support for Parquet anyway, because there's lots of Parquet in the world. If you try to do this with Parquet, it goes, oh, that pile of stuff, it didn't have uniform records. I can't handle that. But well, if you make an Uber schema with Fuse, then it'll work. So I can do that, but here's the rub. Now, if I look at the data, it's got all these nulls in it. It's not the same. I've changed my data. I don't like that. Okay, so there you have it. We've got this, uh, family of formats, um, Zison, Zing, and Zest, which are parallel to JSON, Avro, and Parquet, but they all fit together. And uh, I think it's a better approach. Um, just if you're curious, Zing is about five to 10 times smaller than Zison or JSON, and you can test this yourself. I won't do this. This query runs fast. This, this actually runs kind of slow. And then if you try this yourself, you could look at the sizes. It's about this, in this case, about eight times. Uh, smaller. Okay, I'm going to wrap up here soon. We're 10 minutes on the hour. So um, let me just touch on the Z Lake. I could give a whole two hour talk on this, um, but I'll just show you a couple things. So, um, so I showed you the diagram earlier. Brim app launches a local 
uh, server to manage a, a Z link on a, on a local file system. But the vision is this could reach out over the network using our REST API. You can set up your own private server and share the, a lake with, with members of your team. You can put it in the cloud if you want. And then maybe someday, I don't know who, but maybe someday we'll, some company will come along and offer Z as a service in the cloud. We'll see. Um, and again, I don't want to get into too much detail here. So I'll just I'll kind of net it out and say, we, we actually, we, we stole a bunch of good ideas that were out there. Um, we based the cloud on the Git design pattern and we made it transactional. So when you do a Git commit, a Git like commit on a Z like, a Z commit or a Z load, that's an acid transaction that appears in the commit history of the branch of the pool that you've committed it to. And so this is great because now you can, you can have a production data pipeline and a data like you can make test branches on that production deployment you can run to your heart's content, whatever you want on the test branch, it doesn't affect the main branch. If you have something you want to merge back to main, you can merge it back to main. Um, you might even use GitHub to get a PR approved before you do the merge that's tied to some automation. Um, or you just do experiments and debug and, and drop the branch. Um, and the, uh, the nice thing about <laughs> the way we built this is we, we took all these verbs in this kind of composable tools approach and made an API. So we, we envision that we're not just a big black box that does certain a cer certain way. There's an API that lets uh, orchestration or automation tools come up, hit that API, do introspection, look at the commit log, decide what it wants to do to the system, do ingest, uh, push new things and so forth. Um, and so I, I have a few examples here that you can go through online. Um, and I, I think I'll just go through one of them right now, since we're short on time, I'll do this one. And so this is an example of where I'm going to, I'm going to show you kind of like what an orchestration agent might do. You have this data that's being ingested into a pool. Maybe you've got Zeke set up and it's, grabbing the packets, making Zeke logs, putting them in a pool, like every, I don't know, every 10 seconds or something. And then you want to run automation every five minutes that takes the last bits of live data and does some analysis of it. Um, and maybe what you have is uh, some threat intel data. So this is a, this is kind of a toy threat intel list of bad guys. So that's just a Zeeson file. And so what I'll do is I'll create a bad guys pool I'll, I'll say use that branch and then I'll load the bad guys into the pool. So that's now here. So here's my bad guys. It's just a list of IPs. Those are my bad guys. What I want to do is take the logs that I've, I've ingested in the demo PCAP and I want to join, I want to decorate the bad guy logs. And so here's a script uh, that'll do a join. Um, in, in this fashion. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, let's go back to the main branch on, on, on the demo PCAP pool. Let's create a test branch. Let's say use that branch and then let's run this join and then re and then load that join data into the test um, branch. And now if I run Zappy log, I could see here, here's the main branch, tip of main, and here's the tip of test. And this object got, which is the result of this join, got loaded into here. So when I do a query now on the head of test, I will see all the data in here and all the data in main. And so if I do this and I query count by path, one of the things that script does is it changes the path to market bad guy. So I can see all the bad guys are there, that looks good. And the app doesn't yet know about branches, so I have to merge. Looks good, I have to merge that back to main so now the app can see it. So I've merged it here to main. And if I look for bad guy, there they are, nice. And now let's say, oh shit, I didn't, oh, excuse me. I didn't mean to put, put that in the main. Oh, I messed up. Uh, so let's go back to the main branch. I can say zappy log. 
there's my log. Yeah, I merged this thing. I didn't want to merge it. So let's get rid of that. I can say zappy revert that commit ID. And then if I look at the log, it shows that thing's been reverted. And then if I go back here and search for bad guys, they're gone. I've fixed my problem. I didn't need to put that in there. And then here's the beauty. I reverted the commit, but I didn't, I didn't get rid of the data. So I can actually go back in history and I could say zappy query from demo.pcap at, let's see, let's go back before I reverted it here. And what did I do here? I wanted to look for bad guy and just do a head 10, get the first 10. And there they are. So they're still there and I can use the commit history to go back, but they're not on main, they're not at the tip. So if I, if I take this off, then they're not there. Okay, I have a few more examples in here that are interesting. I'd encourage you to try them on your own, but I think we're about out of time. So I wanna wrap up and just summarize by um, what I did here. I showed you, showed you our new app, Brim. Um, and it's been a really fun experience working on Brim and, and really kind of bucking the idea that we should just do things the way everything else is done and maybe like explore the idea that maybe there's an easier way with a better data model. Um, I showed that Zed could kind of unify the document and relational models and we could leverage this idea of separating the schema policy from the data mechanism. Um, and, and with our binary formats actually be performant. And ultimately, I think we can like be in the ballpark of the best data warehouses that are out there. Um, and then I kind of touched on at the end here how it all comes together in a, a Zed Lake. So we have a ways to go, but, um, but I like James' idea. This was from James, this idea that maybe someday Zed will do for data lakes what Jason did for APIs and really make them simple and easy to use. Um, and I'll just close with this idea. It's hard to make things easy, but it's worth it. Um, and so if you buy this idea and you're interested, we're in all the usual places, please join us on our public Slack channel. If you ask any questions, Phil will be right there, right there to answer. Okay, with that, I will close. And do we take questions? What do we do? I see lots of good comments, thank you in the chat. Okay, I need help from Angelo. You've raised a hand, what do I do? Do I just click on it? One new message. Oh, questions on Discord. So, shall, okay, shall we close out? And oh, here's Q and A. Does search work for IPv6? Well, let's try that. Uh, oh, I haven't shared my screen. The answer is yes. So Farah Brim, uh, put some data with IP6 and you can do a search for IP6. All right, shall we wrap up? The demo data isn't downloading. Oh, we hit the limit. Okay, we'll fix that, sorry. That's, I'll get Phil on that. <laughs> Thank you. All right, uh, thanks Steve for such a wonderful talk. This is amazing. Um, as, as Steve mentioned, we can continue this on Discord. And uh, um, but again, thank you Steve for doing this. Thank you, Gerald. It's been an honor to be part of your community and show up every 10 years. <laughs> and uh, give a little talk. And uh, just a plug, I, just uh, check out our repos, give us stars. I need to raise money at some point and any traction we get will be helpful in, in achieving that goal. So thanks everybody and I'll see you on Discord.